In addition to having written poetry, short stories, and plays, Carol Shields is the author of four novels. Small Ceremonies, which won the Canadian Authors Association Award for the best novel of 1976, The Box Garden, Happenstance, and A Fairly Conventional Woman. Born Carol Warner in suburban Chicago, she married a Canadian civil engineer named Don Shields, became a Canadian citizen, and eventually raised five children, while gradually devoting more and more time to writing. Carol now lives in Winnipeg, where she teaches a creative writing class at the University of Manitoba. One critic has called her a perceptive and sensitive observer of human nature, with deft facility for expressing these observations. My idea for the, my first novel, Small Ceremonies, came out of my leftover accumulated notes from my master's thesis, which was on the Ontario pioneer, Susanna Moody. The book itself is about a woman uh, of about 40 who is writing a biography of Susanna Moody. And so you can see that the novel isn't too far from my own experience. I didn't know if I could write a whole novel but I decided to set myself two pages a day, and that seemed to be a workable writing schedule for me. The title, Small Ceremonies, was suggested by my publishers, who found this phrase in the first chapter or two of the novel. I think it does encapsulate the novel and, and what I think is important, which is that the small, everyday ceremonies we all experience, uh, those are the things that are important and that keep us glued together as, as human beings. I'm interested in the secret lives of people, the silent lives, the parts that are never expressed. But I'm also interested in those rare moments when the silence is breached, uh, when people come together unexpectedly. Uh, you see patterns uh, which I can only describe as being transcendental. Dr. John Pansky. Funny you're feeling, huh? Yes. I feel like a baked biscuit set out to cool. Yeah, me too. What are you here for? Ah, uh, the old waterworks. What? <laughs> Nothing major. Well, that's good. What about you? One of those female things, also not major. You married? Yes. Are you? Married, yes, but not happily. Pardon? Not happily. Married, yes, but not happily married. Too bad. Are you happily married? Yes. I'm one of the lucky ones. Not that I deserve it. What do you mean, not that you deserve it? Uh, I don't know. Well, you said it. What I meant was, I'm not all that terrific a wife. You know, not self-sacrificial. Yeah? Last week when Martin asked me to type something for him, I said, what's the matter with Nell? That's his secretary. Oh, he's got a secretary. Yeah. She's skinny, though. A real stick. And he shares her with two other professors. So I said, what's the matter with Mel? And yeah, what did he say to that? He just said, never mind, Judith. But I felt so mean that I went ahead and did it anyway. The typing, you mean? Mm-hmm. 
So you're not such a rotten wife. Well, I did it. But it doesn't count if you're not willing. I never asked my wife to do any typing for me. Why not? Typing, I don't need. Maybe you asked for something else. Just let me alone. Every night she has to ask me what I did all day at the plant. She says she has to know. I tell her, look, I had to live through it once. Do I have to live through it twice? I see what you mean. You do? Yes. As my mother used to say, I don't want to chew my cabbage twice. You mean you don't ask your husband what he did all day? No, I don't think I ever do. Poor Martin. I sure wish I was married to you. Thank you. When I wrote poetry, I, I, I wrote about the small incidents and observations uh, around me. My own children, people I saw on the street, relatives, people sometimes out of my imagination. Uh, my poetry was generally fairly accessible, and uh, I always felt I knew where I was going, and, and I knew whether or not I got there. When I came to writing novels, and of course novels are a much larger, roomier form, I found that I was still writing about very much the same kind of things, about little bits of the real world. There were just more of them. I think I'm conscious of many links between prose and poetry, and it always surprises me that there aren't more people who, who do both. When I'm writing prose or poetry, I always feel as though I'm making something. That's the way it feels to me. And every phrase, every line, needs its own rhythm and balance. I think I have a poorer memory of my childhood than many writers, such as W.O. Mitchell, who feels that everything that happens to you before the age of 12 stays with you forever. My own childhood memories are not quite as vivid, perhaps because I was a kind of woolly-headed, dreamy kid who always had her nose in a book. I lived a fairly protected, insulated life. And one of the highlights I do remember is going to the library every Saturday morning for story hour. I found the combination of narrative and theater irresistible. Even then, I used to go around saying I wanted to be a poet when I grew up, but I don't think I ever actually believed I'd become a writer, because most girls of my generation only expected to become wives and mothers. I, I very much admire the writer Mavis Gallant. And I sometimes hear her, wor her work dismissed as mere style. And I, it always amazes me to hear something as important as that reduced to something trivial. Style seems to me to be enormously important, not just the final coat of paint you put on a piece of writing. Style is, I think, at least as important uh, to a piece of writing a as content. I think Flaubert's Madame Bovary is the book that's meant the most to me. And of course, Flaubert was a passionate believer in style. I also read John Updike with great pleasure, also Margaret Lawrence, Alice Munro. But I think that as influenced as writers are, they're all concerned about finding voices of their own. And that individual voice does, I think, come in the end. Hello. Hi, oh, Carol. I see you got the letter from Don Mills. Yeah, you got this? Yes, it came to the office so early this week. Well, I think there is one way in which yeah. being a Canadian writer um, might be easier than being an American writer, is that there are fewer of us. We all know each other pretty well. I think there is a sense of a community of writers in Canada. It is important for me to be in touch with other writers. I don't think it matters terribly to a writer where you're living. You go into a room, you shut the door, you very seldom get up and look out the window. Uh, who needs scenery? For 
me, life is a, a chain of stories. And in all my novels, there are scenes in which people tell each other stories. Much more civilized in here, don't you think? Mm -hmm. The kitchen is demoralizing somehow. Why not live a little? Why not? <laughs> Living meanly is the greatest sin. Needless economy thins the blood. It cuts out the heart. What about thrift? Oh, thrift is all right. But cheapness, for its own sake, is destructive. We knew this well-to-do lawyer in Montreal. Beautiful home. Summer place in the Rideau. Annual excursions to London. The whole picture. And when he wanted to buy new clothes, do you know where he went? <laughs> You'll never guess. The Salvation Army outlet. Mm -hmm. He'd go through piles of old clothes till he found a 44 medium. And that's what he wore. Pinstripe suits that were shiny at the elbows. Navy blue blazers that were faded across the shoulders. Pants that were baggy at the knees. He just didn't care. He put them all in a shopping bag, take them home, put them on, stand in front of the mirror and say, well, I'm no fashion plate, but it only cost me three bucks. Terrible. It really is. I know this woman, a widow, not wealthy. Not even well-to-do, but not poverty-stricken either. She owns her own house, has an adequate pension, and so on. But she had to have a breast removed, a terrible operation. She suffered terribly. And after she was discharged from the hospital, she took the subway home, the subway, with this great white bandage where her left breast had been, on the subway. That's awful. But that's not the worst part. What could be worse than that? That woman was my own mother. Oh, Judith. Judith, why didn't I tell you? Tell me what? That man with the second-hand suits was my father. You have to worry about whether you get your point across. But I hate to explain. That is, I, I hate to over-explain. Subtlety, I think, is what I value most. And I agree with Uptight that there have to be surprises for the close reader, the astute reader, rewards, you know, for paying attention. Writing is hard in the beginning. It's hard in the middle, and it's hard at the end. But one good thing about being a writer is the power you have to change things. If a story isn't going quite to your liking, you can leap in and turn it around. And that's the sort of thing you can't do in real life. In fiction, you can. The biggest thing I would ever say to anyone who wanted to be a writer is never save anything. You know, never save a story. Uh, never keep it in your bag until you found the right opportunity. Uh, never save an image. Use it. I think once you use these things, instead of storing them up for the big day when you finally are going to write, I think what you find is that your supply is replenished. Otherwise, I don't think it grows if you're simply hoarding all your best ideas. The other advice, of course, is simply to read. I think that's the way to learn to write, is to read.